What's good, family? Welcome back to the channel. I hope everyone's having an amazing day. But this video right here, it gets really, really weird. And I came across it. It seems like this is some leaked footage from behind the scenes of the Nickelodeon set while they were filming the, the series Victorious. And now keep in mind, this was for Nickelodeon. This is for children. This was during my age. So I would definitely suggest any parents that have children just be very careful as to what your children are watching on TV when it comes to Nickelodeon and Disney Channel, no matter how innocent it may seem, because quite obviously the producer on this set doesn't have good intentions for the people on the set, which happen to be young men and women and the viewers itself. So, like I said, it can get a little disturbing, but let's get straight into this video and let me show you guys this. What would they do if we just had a really intense... Ew, you're blowing your nose on my face, Matt. It's a little bit of mucus. Ew! Yeah. And this is my favorite friend. I call her Palamine. And I like to cover her with Calamine look. <laughs> <laughs> Calamine for a Palamine. Prove it. So do you guys ever, uh, you know, kiss each other? Um, you know, that's not where our issues have really been. You know, the physical, it's all there. It's, just, it's all there. It's, uh, it's, um, it's when we're not in private, you know? When we go to parties, it just gets really... She gets very possessive. I got possessive. Yeah. You got that sniffing look. You got that, that, that sniffing look that I... Sniff me now! <laughs> Now, some people were just saying that this is just kids being kids, but this is not the type of way I was when I was a kid, nor of any of my friends, whether they were guys, girls, no matter who it was. And the influence came from this man, Dirty Dan Schneider. That's the name he goes by. He was one of the executive guys when it comes to Nickelodeon. He was the one running the entire show. And now Patrick CC here is about to expose him and all of his dirty work as to what he did to all the crew members and the employees that he had and the whole nine yards. So without further ado, let's see what's going on in this video right here. Is it a coincidence that three convicted pedophiles were working at the largest children's television network during the peak of its success and popularity? What if I told you that there was also a convicted pedophile managing the children that were often cast on the network's shows? What if I told you that many of the underage girls were forced to kiss men over the age of 18 on camera. And then what if you found out that multiple of these young victims grew up and were caught performing inappropriate sexual acts with children themselves, Damn. repeating the cycle of abuse? These are not rumors, these are facts. When you combine these facts with the realization that many of the jokes, physical comedy, outfits, and even random pieces of the set were sexual innuendos. At some point, you'd start to eliminate the possibility of this being a coincidence and start thinking this was all by design. Today, I'm going to break down exactly how a powerful network of have, executives separated child- We have Amber Bynes right here that ended up getting caught roaming LA streets completely naked with no clothes on. She ended up going crazy. Then we have Ariana Grande going on podcast openly admitting as how she's a witch. Things like this that happen in your childhood has a great effect on how these people end up turning out. Today, I'm going to break down exactly how a powerful network of executives separated child actors from their families, have their actors depend on them for emotional support, then abuse their power to overwork these children, rake in billions in profits, silence anyone who dared to speak out, and then bragged about it in front of the whole world. And just like most organized crime operations, they typically funnel up to one top boss, the untouchable creator of this machine. Insert Dan Schneider, the man behind the camera, the esteemed Nickelodeon producer who created some of the most iconic children's television programs in history. At the end of the day, I love it when the cast gets sassy with me because I get to write all the scripts with some very talented writers, but I get to, I can put them in any horrible predicament I choose. Dan Schneider was a child actor himself, most notable for his role as Dennis on Head of the Class. During this time, he and his co-star Brian Robbins became great friends. The pair were later asked to co-host the second annual Kids' Choice Awards by a Nickelodeon producer called Albie Hecht. The three men struck a friendship and frequently discussed creating a project together. By 1993, Hecht had become a high-level executive at Nickelodeon 
Nickelodeon and challenge Robbins to pitch him a children's television series that their new production studio could pitch to Nickelodeon. At the time, Nickelodeon was not yet the powerhouse it would become. The network struggled to become profitable in the 80s as they were losing millions of dollars per year. One year, they were actually the lowest viewed network out of all US cable channels. Early 90s cartoons like Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy were allowing the network to pick up higher viewership, but their live action shows struggled. So Brian recruited Dan and they came up with a sketch comedy show like Saturday Night Live, but for children, called All That. Dan wrote in his personal blog, We did a nationwide talent search and got very lucky. Every kid we ended up hiring for the original All That cast turned out to be fantastic. Josh Server, Keenan Thompson, Kel Mitchell, Katrina Johnson, Lori Beth Denberg, Angelique Bates, and Alyssa Reyes. Dan recalled that the show didn't test well and that the network felt like kids wouldn't like a sketch comedy show, but they took a chance on him and the show immediately became a huge success for Nickelodeon as soon as it aired. All that would go on to have 10 seasons and become one of the most culturally significant teen Nickelodeon shows of all time. Imagine how proud the executives were of Dan's performance. They were finally getting the big break they needed, and Nickelodeon was coming closer to becoming a profitable network. The only thing that could ruin their momentum would be some sort of scandal or reports of child and that's exactly what happened, according to Angelique Bates, who was only 12 years old when the abuse began. But from 1992 to 1996, I was a series regular on Nickelodeon's All That. I was only 12 years old, and that's when my nightmare began. I was physically, mentally, emotionally abused in front of the producers and cast members, and sometimes they could even hear me yelling. But nothing was done to help me, until approximately... 1996 when CPS was called and when CPS came I was pressured by all the adults that were set to protect me to stay silent I did and I have but I can no longer stay silent and I won't my name is Angelique Bates and I am an adult survivor of child abuse and this is my story. Angelique is the first known survivor who has spoken Damn. up against Nickelodeon's corrupt practices, and her story is extremely important because it also highlights the parents' involvement in such abuse. Angelique recalls Nickelodeon producers being upset that her mom was constantly supervising her. They started having a bull's eye for her, it was that she was one of the parents that was not going to leave me unattended on set because by law, parents are supposed to be there. So okay. um, they didn't like that fact that she wouldn't leave. Some parents would leave their kids unsupervised while they work. They trusted the producers and did not want to interfere with their child's opportunity to build a career for themselves. Angelique's mother was not like that, and she even recalled a time where someone made a sexual advance towards her, and her mother threatened to sue the network. Unfortunately, Angelique's mother was also physically and emotionally abused towards her, so she wasn't safe on set or at home. Double ass short yeah. my mom, my mom's beating my ass, but then she's like protecting me from Nickelodeon all at the same time. Like, I, she blocked all that. Like I said, the reason why they started hating her was because she was blocking me from that and because she was turning down sexual advances from it. Angelique slowly received less and less work due to her mother's involvement and believed she was blackballed by Nickelodeon because she and her mother could not be controlled. And because no wrongdoings were ever officially reported, all that ratings continued to soar. The series propelled the careers of cast members Keenan Thompson and Kel Mitchell, who starred in the first All That spin-off, Keenan and Kel. The show originally aired on Nickelodeon for four seasons from 1996 to 2001 and was equally as successful as All That, winning the Favorite TV Show Award at the 1998 Kids' Choice Awards. They also starred in the Nickelodeon cult classic film, Good Burger. However, with Schneider in charge, not much changed behind the scenes. Taisha Hampton, ex-wife of Kel Mitchell, spoke out on suspicious behavior she experienced on Nickelodeon sets. Taisha was married to Mitchell from 1999 to 2005, but they originally met on the set of Good Burger where she was casted as an extra. She too backs up the claims that parents were not around. And these parents, like Kel's parents, were not with him. All these parents of the kids on the show, their parents were not with them. Separate the children from the parents. That seems to be a theme with Nickelodeon. There are two main reasons why they likely did this. Firstly, it seems like Nickelodeon was trying to take advantage of loose child labor laws in Florida, where the shows were filmed. According to the 1998 Florida Child Labor Code, minors aged 15 and under could work 40 hours per week as long as it was during a holiday or summer vacation. 16 and 17 year olds who graduated from high school or had their GED did not have to abide by any work hour restrictions. A school superintendent could 
also issue a waiver of hours, and there is no law that specifically states a parent must supervise their kid while their child is working. However, regardless of what the code says, child labor experts say the laws were rarely enforced or penalized when there was a violation. In 1992, Jeffrey Newman of the National Child Labor Committee said that, child labor today is at a point where violations are greater than at any point during the 1930s. One report found that the average business could expect to be inspected once every 50 years or so. Inspectors spend only about 5% of their time looking into child labor problems. Businesses across the entire nation were taking advantage of loose child labor laws in the 90s. Do you think Nickelodeon was any different? Children are more susceptible to exploitation and abuse in the workplace due to their vulnerability and lack of bargaining power. Think of how easy it would be for a TV producer to torment and gaslight a young actor if they weren't getting their lines right or performing to the producer's standards. But if their parents were there on set witnessing their child get scolded, they might cause a fuss. Producers want as little friction as possible, so it's not crazy to think that they probably cast talent with parents who stay out of their way. But once they do get the parents out of the way, what do they do with the kids? Because we would get into clubs and we were young, like 16, 17 years old, we'd, we'd be in clubs. And the people on the set in Florida made us fake IDs. And so then I started thinking, I was like, wait, 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 what? And then they were talking about or and they were talking about like they would, people on the set would show like pornos and they'd give the us kids, alcohol. Those were kid, like young kids on that set. Yeah, these were grown 30 year old Damn. men and women. Showing this to the kids. When we see that first clip in the beginning with that one girl talking about a whole three way, there has to be someone that influenced her to even have that type of thought. And this is man, Dirty Dan. Dirty Dan Schneider, bro. Old kids. But another one of the cast members was, was like, um, cleaning their, cleaning Dan Schneider's car with a bikini on. And now at this time, she had been 15, 16 years old. There were other times they would have like parties where the parents would, bro, wouldn't disgusting. be there and they'd give us alcohol. And another one of the people on the cast was giving blood to the producers. Wow. Tracy Brown, whose son Brian Hearn was cast on all that for season seven and eight, tells a similar story from a mother's perspective. Because there are many times on that set where they're like, hey, we want- I did want to make mention for YouTube purposes. This video right here is for educational purposes, all right? You know, just for parents to be aware. If you ever want your kid to go into the industry, just be extra cautious and aware of the people that are on set and you definitely do want to supervise them invite Brian to a party and I'm like hey just Brian and they go yes and I'm like no and they don't like moms that take control of their child but I had heard things so guess what you don't need to like me and they were like well bye bye and I was like let's go I was not gonna do anything for the money like y'all need to understand I'm that woman I'm not gonna do anything that might compromise my son, not even for the income. But many even suspect the that the producer's crazy. perversion may have been scripted into the shows, starting with Kyra on Keenan and Kill, who was just 12 years old but was always trying to flirt and make sexual advances on the much older Kill. She would refer to him as her boyfriend despite him being obviously uninterested because she is a child. At the same time that Keenan and Kel were huge stars, one all that cast member emerged and became the most iconic Nickelodeon star of all time, Amanda Bynes. At just 10 years old, Amanda stood out amongst her peers and showcased her comedic talents through various characters and sketches. As a preteen, she was maturely confident and comfortable on screen. According to Leon Frierson, who was cast on all that since season one, Schneider showed clear favoritism for Bynes. We had to go to school on set. There would be times when Amanda would just be missing, he recalled in the docuseries. A lot of times we would hear she would be with Dan, pitching ideas and writing. We see them grow closer to each other on set. He continued, Amanda Bynes' parents were very hands-on in her career, specifically her dad. His presence was always felt. A big part of that was his relationship with Dan Schneider. Like we said before, hands-on parents were not wanted 
wanted on Nickelodeon's set, that is, unless they are bending to the interests of Dan Schneider. Despite the favoritism, Dan never planned on giving Amanda her own show because he claims he never wanted to be on children's television. He initially created and helped produce a series called Guys Like Us for the United Paramount Network at their primetime 8pm slot. Guys Like Us revolves around two young men, Sean Barker and Jared Harris. The pair are forced to look after Jared's six-year-old brother Maestro, who comes to live with them after Jared's father accepts a job opportunity overseas. Why don't you go wash your hands? They're clean! Well then go wash your feet! Dan's sitcom, designed for adults, was an utter failure as he was not funny nor creative enough to keep adults entertained. It was cancelled after one season due to abysmal ratings, so he shifted his focus to creating a show around Amanda. The Amanda Show was a sketch comedy television program that had a very similar look, feel, and comedic style as All That and Kenan and Kel. Schneider struck gold again. The Amanda Show became the highest rated live action television program on Nickelodeon during its run. Amanda portrayed various characters that would become iconic iconic such as Judge Trudy, dismissed, the dance and lobsters. Crazy Courtney, <laughs> and Amanda's obsessive fan Penelope Taint. And it took us 20 years to realize that her last name was a sexual innuendo. People also think that her catchphrase, Amanda please, was built off the phrase, a man to please, which would be such a deep detailed level of innuendo that it's kind of hard to believe. However, yeah, as this video goes it on, it just seems more and more possible. People today also believe that her sketch called Amanda's Jacuzzi may have been inappropriate since the whole concept was her as a 13 year old interviewing mostly grown men in a hot tub. And of course, another foot joke. Is it also true that you can put both of your feet inside your mouth at the same time? I don't know. <laughs> no. Even Dan decided to jump in the jacuzzi with Amanda. People believe Dan was almost bragging by creating lightly sexual conduct into his kids' shows, like the Spitballer 5000, which was a phallic object that the kids had to blow into to launch a giant spitball at someone. Behind the scenes footage indicates that Dan and Amanda were very close, which is why it was shocking that The Amanda Show abruptly ended in 2002, just three years after it aired on Nickelodeon. In an interview with The Times, Bynes explained that she decided to leave for other opportunities. I was having fun, but at 15, you don't want to be doing what you did when you were 12. Schneider also commented on her exit with, I've seen kids in her position experiment with drugs and be too promiscuous, but Amanda has avoided all of that. My wife, who knows her, says she's almost like Marsha Brady in that she's so clean cut and wholesome. This quote seems characteristically odd from Dan, like she was just talking about transitioning to more mature roles like her sitcom What I Like About You, and he had to bring up drugs and sex for some reason. Many years later, cast members would come out yeah, and speak about weird. how they perceived Amanda behind the scenes. Actress Chelsea Brummett, who co-starred on all that, recalled, She was closed off to everyone. You'd ask her a question and she'd give you a quick answer to end the conversation. She was always defiant with her dad, but she tried to hide things from her dad. She always seemed like she was trying to hide things. They would butt heads. This recountment does line up with the timeline of 2003 where Amanda sought to be emancipated from her parents at just 17 years old. In June of 2003, Amanda's agent, manager, and lawyer were all abruptly fired by her parents. The young star, now 17, was seeking legal emancipation from her parents, who were furious when they discovered that the reps had concealed this fact from them. Unfortunately, Amanda was not able to successfully get emancipated. During this rough patch in her life, Bynes reportedly leaned on Schneider and his wife, Lisa Lillian, for support. She was spending a lot of time with us, said Lillian, but she never left her family's house. This direct quote from Dan's wife is strong evidence that Dan and Amanda were close offset. Amanda has spoken out very strongly against her father and maybe at the time looked at Schneider as a replacement father figure. Dan also recently recounted a night where Amanda ran away from home. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. 
She ended up being taken to the police. As much as people blame Dan for the downfall of Amanda's career, or claim that he had suspicious involvement that's deeper and more inappropriate, throughout Amanda's whole life and numerous public spirals, she never blamed or accused Dan Schneider of anything. All of her anger and horrible accusations were towards her biological father. However, the cloud of mystery and potentially inappropriate behavior surrounding Amanda, as well but as at her the same time, it's, it's the father's priority and responsibility to protect his daughter, to protect his children at the end of the day. Like, I remember when I was young, I was probably like, man, probably like eight or even younger. Around anywhere from like seven, yeah, around like five, six, seven, eight, nine, around that age, I was going to gymnastics. Now, it was fun, you know what I'm saying? I was doing flips and boom, boom, boom. And, you know, we just ended up ending gymnastics. I wasn't mad about it or anything, but later on, I ended up finding out that the reason why we ended the gymnastics because it was either my mom or dad just didn't like the way that the coach had just touched children. Now, I don't know if it was like them blowing it out of proportion. I don't know if there was valid reason behind it, but that was the reason why they took me out. And that's very respectful. Like, that's respectable. You feel what I'm saying? Like, that's just the parent's obligation to do when it comes to their children. You know, just don't let anything slide. And he ended up letting things slide. So I could understand. I could see why she could probably have some resentment towards him. But at the end of the day, who really did the trauma to her? You feel what I'm saying? Let's find that on this. Let's continue. Obviously, broken Let's family life seemed to be a common gray area Dan found himself in with his stars. Over the years, some of the most prominent stars like Jamie Lynn Spears, Jeanette McCurdy, and Ariana Grande all had absent fathers. On one hand, you can blame the parents. On another, you could look at Dan as a predatory opportunist. Or maybe it's a little bit of both. But there was a real convicted predator who worked underneath Dan Brothers Schneider. Like Jason Cotton. Handy, a production assistant who worked on All That and The Amanda Show, exchanged email addresses and phone numbers with parents and kids who thought he was a friendly and helpful presence on set. You thought, oh. I could be friends with this person, said MJ, the mother of a former actress on The Amanda Show, who was identified as Brandy. The mother was mortified when she saw her 11-year-old daughter looking at a graphic email from Handy. It was a picture of him naked, masturbating. Yo! And he said he had sent it to her because he wanted her to see that he was thinking of her. Her daughter left the entertainment industry after that email. Handy was arrested in April of 2003 after law enforcement received a tip about him. When the police investigated his home, they found over 1,700 images of young girls in erotic poses, as well as seven videos on CD files of children engaged in sexually explicit conduct. In Handy's personal diary, he wrote sentences like, I am a pedophile full blown. He added, I have really been giving into my desire for little girls these past few weeks. And then he detailed his day to day struggle on how he could find a victim that he could sexually assault. Oh, felony counts, one of lewd acts on a child and one of district exploitation. He got out and in 2014 committed two other felony sex offender violations with a child. Allegedly, Handy's case prompted Nickelodeon to toughen its background checks for all employees, trying to prevent this from happening again. Yet somehow, this was not even close to the last time a pedophile would infiltrate Nickelodeon's network. Actor Drake Bell formed a bond with the dialogue coach Brian Peck during the second season of The Amanda Show. Peck, who has no relation to Drake's co-star Josh Peck, would invite Drake to his house for acting lessons. These lessons were supervised by Drake's father, Joe, who was told that Brian Peck was a skilled coach who would help Drake secure more acting opportunities. However, over time, Joe became uncomfortable with their relationship. And unfortunately, I started with seeing Brian start to just hang around Drake too much. And it didn't, didn't set well with me. Drake would be in the dressing room or something, and in would pop Brian. And um, just touch Drake. You know, do things that, wait a second, what are you doing? Drake can put that on himself. And the thing is, this is in front of people. Joe expressed his concerns with production personnel and said he was uncomfortable with Brian, only to be called homophobic because of Brian's sexual orientation. Therefore, Joe backed off. Once this got back to Brian, he manipulated Drake into severing ties with his father slash manager, suggesting that Joe was sabotaging Drake's career. Peck subsequently integrated himself into multiple areas of Bell's life and became a father figure for the young actor. Eventually, Peck convinces Drake's mother to let him stay at his house during 
during auditions. These predators entice the children with fame and fortune, convince them that their parents are trying to hold them back, then totally isolate them and do who knows what behind closed doors. It's likely that all oh, the kids sad. who made it out unscathed were because of parents who stepped in and removed their child from the situation before it was too late. However, the more popular the actor was, such as Drake Bell, the more difficult it became to remove them from the industry. Sadly, with Brian Peck and Drake Bell, we do know what happened behind closed doors. When Drake slept on Brian's couch, the sexual assault began. I was sleeping on the couch where I would usually sleep, and I woke up to him. I, I just opened my eyes, I woke up, and he was, uh, he was sexually assaulting me. Um, why don't you think of the worst stuff that someone can do to somebody as a sexual assault, and that'll answer your question. Drake Damn. wouldn't tell anyone Bro, I, I know what we're getting into in this video right here. Like, it's really getting real. Like, this is the reality of the world that we live in. You know, in the industry, entertainment industry, Hollywood, bro, these are just some straight up weirdos for, like, straight up. And it's unfortunate that human beings, it's unfortunate that this Drake has to go through this. Like, he has to live with that for the rest of his life, man. That's, bro, that's just sad for several months. The abuse persisted until Drake began spending more time at a girlfriend's house. One day, when he was supposed to meet with Brian, Drake said he did not want to hang out. Brian then started calling his phone nonstop. When Drake failed to answer, Brian obsessively started calling his girlfriend's house, which is when the girlfriend's mother suspected something was wrong and took Drake to her family therapist. He later detailed the abuse to his own mother, who called the police. I had to be excruciatingly detailed about every single thing and time that it had happened with two absolute strangers. The worst part was I had to make a phone call to Brian and get him to admit to what he'd done. The police monitored a wired phone call with Brian, who broke into a full-on confession that led to his arrest. The investigation was conducted privately, and Bell remained unidentified to the public for several years due to his age at that time. Drake did tell Dan Schneider about this situation right before the trial. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? But Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me with my speech for the judge? And I said, of course, and I did. During Brian Peck's trial, numerous prominent figures in the entertainment industry wrote letters of support vouching for his character, including James Marston, Taron Killam, Growing Pain star Alan Thicke, Boy Meets World actors Will Friedel and Ryder Strong, among others. Some of these figures, including Friedel and Strong, have since expressed their regret over writing the letters and stated that they were manipulated by Peck's misinformation. Brian Peck was convicted of child molestation in 2004, pleading no contest to a charge of oral copulation with a minor under 16 that abysmal and code low sentencing, Peck got out and secured a job working for Disney's The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody in 2006, where he voiced London Tipton's Talking Mirror for three episodes. The Disney Channel hired a registered sex offender. Despite these horrible circumstances, Drake remained in the industry and would go on to star alongside Josh Peck in their legendary buddy comedy, Drake and Josh, which again caused the network's ratings to explode to new heights. The series premiere was watched by 3.2 million viewers, the network's highest rated I'm not gonna lie, Drake and Josh was fire. I used to watch Drake and Josh when I was younger. Series premiere in nearly 10 years. Drake and Josh episodes regularly saw viewership upwards of 5, 6, 7 million. As of 2006, the show ranked consistently among the 10 most watched cable shows across all of television. And you could just add Zoe 101 to the list of Dan's dominant programs. Yeah, I used to watch Zoe 101 too. Which saw an average of 3 million viewers per episode. It was on the set of Zoe 101 where even more photos emerged of Dan getting a little too comfortable with the cast, particularly Aaron. Aaron Sanders, on, who was merely man. a child being held and coddled on Dan's lap. Come you can on. also see this photo where Dan's hand is resting on the child's lower back. Zoe 101 also had 34 different kissing scenes across its four seasons. While this may not seem that strange for a teen drama show, it did often lead to underage female actresses kissing over 18-year-old males. Brando Eaton was 20 years old and Victoria Justice was 14. Yo! Victoria at this time also had to kiss Jaron Vosberg, who was 18. 
And get this, 12-year-old Jamie Lynn Spears had to kiss 22-year-old Justin Timberlake on the set of All That, and Justin dated Britney Spears, which is Jamie's sister, three years earlier. Also, this Zoe 101 scene resurfaced recently, and many believe it to be a sexual innuendo. Spears' co-star, Alexa Nicolas, recalled Dan making a crew member squirt the syringe of goo at Spears over and over again. It's also important to remember that all of the information that you now know from this video was totally totally unknown by the public at the time. All the allegations and predatory behavior was all silenced before they could ever reach headlines. Barely any media outlets were reporting on why pedophiles were allowed to work on set. Survivors were scared to speak their truth, and even if they wanted to, they would have to go through a publicist or rely on a- But during that time, it was much harder to even get information out to like the mass majority of people, because the internet wasn't even that popping. Like, you could post something on MySpace or something like that, maybe Facebook. But like once like YouTube and like Instagram and all the social medias that we have now like are popping now, now it's much easier to get something, you know, information like this out to the public. But before it's really hard. You have people controlling all the platforms potentially corrupt media outlet to tell their story the right way. All anyone saw was the final product on television, so we assumed everything was consensual and safe and approved by people who had the best interests of the children in mind. Even if the network was suspicious of Dan and his production staff, which they weren't, they were going to do anything and everything to protect his reputation because Nickelodeon was red hot. At this point, they had been the number one network in viewers aged 2 to 11 for over a decade. They were raking in millions of viewers and billions of dollars. Dan had more power than ever and was about to unleash all of his sick fantasies through iCarly. The basic premise of iCarly was that Carly Shay, played by previous Drake and Josh co-star Miranda Cosgrove, and her friends Sam and Freddie, played by Jeanette McCurdy and Nathan Cress, produce a web show from Carly's older brother's apartment. The show resonated with the real-world rise of online content creation and the growing influence of social media platforms like YouTube during the 2000s. The show within a show encouraged fan interaction by incorporating segments that invited viewers to participate in the show's interactive elements. Additionally, the characters often responded to fan mail and viewer submissions on their web show, further blurring the lines between fiction and reality. Like, take a look at this time they called a 12-year-old fan. Do you have any questions for Sydney? I follow your Twitter. How old are you? I'm 12. No way, I just turned 16. You're 12? Yes. I'm like a little over double that. <laughs> yeah. You're just Jerry's all old. So you so um what do you like about iCarly? I love it. It's really funny. Anything else you want to know about uh, iCarly or any questions or anything? No. No, you're all set? <laughs> no. Nope. Thank you. Do you know what I know? Would you like us to get on a plane and come to your house? Yes. Oh, well that's not going to happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Dan himself often communicated directly with fans on his blog, danwarp.blogspot.com, where he gave behind-the-scenes information and did Q&As. He also started giving tons of behind-the-scenes clips to his Dan Warp YouTube channel, giving us insight on the cast's uncomfortability around him. What? It wouldn't be a video for my Carly if I didn't do this to you. I don't know. Oh, God! What are you doing? I don't know. What's going on? What are you wearing today? Who did your outfit? Who's your, I've had too much caffeine! Don't do anything with this footage. Please, it's so lame. Did you know that the average adult American male has 18 hairs on each of his toes? No. This is what happens when it gets late. Uh, yeah, okay. seriously. Let us go home, Dan. <laughs> we would be home if you had gotten what? some of your lines what? right earlier uh, in the day, right? Uh, Am I right? Yeah! yeah. Yeah, who's in Paris now? Who's in Paris? No! What are you doing? I'm scared. <laughs> Jeanette. Hello. Susie May Page wants to know. Susie May Page. Yeah, if you could fill a pool with get out of here. Sorry. Wants to know if you could fill a pool with anything you like and swim in it, what would it be and why? Um confetti because it's a celebration in the pool. Okay, that makes no sense. Okay. Miranda. Pineapple juice. What? I didn't ask the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I heard. I was thinking this whole time. Uh, okay, the question is, if you wanted me to hit you with a bottle of something, what would it be? Oh. Pineapple yeah. juice? Okay, here comes. This is why I'm in Hollywood. Yeah. Get your cereal, kids. <laughs> Did she say nice things about me? Bro, Dan <laughs> has one talent, and is making people feel uncomfortable. Like, jeez. I will taser, if necessary. Uh-oh. I have the taser. Oh. I've been using it a long time. I said lots of nice things. 
So you would like think that. like the more you hang out with someone, the more comfortable you get. But it's like the more you hang out with this guy right here, they just get more and more uncomfortable. Oh. This dude is weird. That's gonna get on TV. That's gonna get on TV. <laughs> In these clips, you can get a glimpse of Dan's unpredictability. I mean, just look at how Miranda steps away from Dan as he proceeds to make his way around her back, and then hugs her from behind as she stands awkwardly still. As you can see, while Dan is shoving a camera in these actors, and as she steps away from Dan, clips you can get a glimpse of Dan's unpredictability. I mean, just look at how Miranda. Oh, look it. He's like a he's bro. He's like a literal monster. He's a literal monster. Look how scared she gets. He's like, oh, and the way he's just walking directly towards her, like, you could just tell he has no good intentions, bro. Miranda steps away from this Dan as he weird. proceeds to make his way around her back, and then hugs her from behind as she stands awkwardly still. As you can see, while Dan is shoving a camera in these actors' faces, they're often confused. Is he joking? Is he angry? Is he creepy? Is he going to touch them or grab them? They look extremely uncertain around him as he talks to them like a classic jester. But iCarly was a massive success for the network throughout its six seasons from 2007 to 2012. The pilot episode debuted on Nickelodeon to an audience of 4.1 million, followed by the second episode on the same day with 3.9 million viewers. The show was nominated for an Emmy Award for Outstanding Children's Program five times, and averaged 4.6 million viewers throughout its time on Nickelodeon. Somehow, Dan managed to outdo Drake and Josh. But looking back on the show, many of the jokes and innuendos were more blatant than we remember. How long? 3.2 seconds. Yeah! That's the longest it's ever taken you to beat me! Or how about the sack, which was Dan making fun of the Snuggie. You're just sitting on your couch, trying to polish your bowling ball, but your blanket keeps flying off your body. It keeps flying off my body. Like, are we reading into it too much, or is polishing your ball while advertising the sack not strategic? They mentioned that the sack comes in four different colors. The sack comes in rash red, mucus green, hus yellow, or blue. His shows are always displaying close-ups of feet and putting cast members in predicaments where they have to touch each other's feet. Nobody thinks feet are this funny, especially not for them to be such a recurring bit in a television show. Many have pointed out that the Nickelodeon logo at one point was a foot, suggesting that Dan's influence was so strong he got them to change their logo momentarily to his fetish. I even found something on his blog that was particularly interesting. He had a segment called Fun Facts on his blog where he would go through an iCarly script and talk about tiny little details and why they matter. Like this one where he refers to Sam's necklace and how it's made of the same plastic that the antique radios that he collects are made out of. I mention this because it proves that there are no coincidences with what you see on screen. No matter how small or insignificant it may seem, Dan put it there on purpose. In this same episode, which is called I Date a Bad Boy, Dan says, Scenes begin with Carly and Sam cutting a boy's hair. We see the first of two penny tees in this one hour episode. This one on Sam says, Noodle booty. What does noodle booty mean? Why did Dan specifically point out her shirt and want us to know what it says? In another blog post, he specifically points out one of his intentionally inappropriate jokes. One where he wrote a joke where an adult woman sexualizes 17-year-old Nathan Cress. Dan writes, On the first few takes when Jane said her line, Hey, those pants fit you real good. She was looking at the front of his pants. I had the director step in quietly and tell her that, because this is for Nickelodeon, we'd prefer she look at the back of his pants on that line. Winky face. I guess Dan thinks that complimenting a young boy's butt is somehow more appropriate. Additionally, take a look at this 2010 blog post where he discusses adults who watch iCarly. He writes, There are around 150 people who work on iCarly, and none of us approach it like we're making a kid's show. We make iCarly no differently than if we were writing and producing a primetime half-hour comedy for NBC, CBS, or any one of the major broadcast networks. This statement directly contradicts what he said while addressing the Quiet On Set documentary. Some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Uh -huh. What do you think of that? Every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. So Dan, are the jokes for adults, like you said 10 years ago on your blog, or are they for kids? 
like you just said recently, when the pressure is at an all-time high. It was also during iCarly when 47-year-old Martin Weiss, who managed dozens of child actors, was formally charged with sexually abusing a formal client. The victim told police that he had sex with Weiss 30 to 40 times about six years ago, and the abuse ended when he turned 15 years old. But Weiss denied that it was grape because the 15-year-old boy showed interest. But the boy said that Martin convinced him that this was common in the industry and denying him would ruin his career. Yet again, Damn. a pedophile infiltrated traded sound like a ditty Nickelodeon and nothing changed still Dan was absolutely dominating. He likely had unimaginable power at the network. Whatever he said goes, but he may have gotten a little too comfortable, maybe even cocky, because his next two shows, Victorious and Sam and Cat, would start to get him in a lot of trouble. Schneider was challenged with writing a competitor to Disney Channel's Hannah Montana. Zoe 101 had recently ended, and Dan knew that featured actress Victoria Justice had star power. If there is anything I've learned about kids today, and I'm not saying this is good or bad, it's that they all want to be stars. This direct quote from Dan potentially backs up accusations that he uses these teenagers' desires for stardom to manipulate them. Ironically, the plot of Victorious is about a girl who attends a performing arts school and aspires to be a famous singer. Singer. In 2010, iCarly and Victorious were the top two live-action shows on Nickelodeon, helping Nick maintain its 16-year status as the number one network on all of cable. Victorious aired from 2010 to 2013, through four seasons, winning favorite TV show at the 2012 and 2013 Kids' Choice Awards, beating out iCarly, as well as receiving four Emmy nominations. To the surprise of no one, Dan created another iconic children's TV show, but at what cost? Before the show premiered, Nickelodeon Productions partnered with the Columbia Epic label group of Sony Music Entertainment to co-produce the series to develop talent and release their music. Ariana Grande famously got her big break on Victorious. She was the perfect addition to the show due to her amazing singing capabilities. But her role on the show was the air-headed girl who says literally anything that is on her mind. Perfect for Dan to take advantage of and insert more innuendos. Sometimes I wonder if you can get juice from a potato. Is it possible for a teenage girl to drink water upside down? Mm, I'm thirsty! It's not this possible! Is bad. This is bad. <laughs> this clip of Dan and the Victorious cast behind the scenes has been dissected many times over the years, where Ariana and Elizabeth Gillis seem visibly uncomfortable due to Dan's presence. That was one of the better things I've ever heard. Hey! Hi, what's going on here? Nothing. <laughs> cut out that part. Why are you sitting on the floor of the set? Because we are! Ariana is constantly looking around, covering up her body as Dan towered over her. Many in the comments speculate that Liz started causing distractions so that Dan wouldn't do whatever they seem to Bro, be afraid of. she definitely of. did do that. She covered up However, her body. However, Liz Gillis actually ended up marrying a Nickelodeon producer that she met on the set of Victorious. Michael Corcoran is a very close friend to Dan Schneider. He wrote the theme songs for iCarly and Victorious. Liz and Michael began dating in 2012 when she was 18 and he was 40. They did meet on set before she was 18 which leads many to believe that she was groomed, but they are still together to this day. According to Jeanette McCurdy, Schneider regularly compared the iCarly cast to that of Victorious. The Victorious kids get drunk together all the time. The iCarly kids are so wholesome. We need to give you guys a little edge, Schneider said, according to McCurdy. Now, supplying minors with alcohol is a major accusation. There is definitely a lot of online evidence showing that the Victorious cast were very close, often mingling and hanging out after hours. But whether or not they they are drunk is impossible to determine. However, the actor who portrayed Beck on Victorious may have confirmed McCurdy's statements on a TikTok that read, when you don't remember the plotline to a single Victorious episode, but you remember going out partying every night. Daniela Monet, who played the lead's older sister, Trina Vega, told Insider that some of the actors' outfits on the show were not age-appropriate, and that she wouldn't even wear some of that today as an adult. Daniela also recalled a time when she contacted Nickelodeon about a Victoria's scene where she ate a pickle while applying lip gloss. She expressed concern to the network that it was too sexual to air, but Nickelodeon aired it anyway. And in case you were wondering if Dan ever slowed down on his foot content, no. He actually ramped it up. There we go. Spread your toes, spread your toes, girl. 
Woo! I still say this is not performing! How about two girls fighting over a guy's foot while he sings a song? Wow, they're really soft. <laughs> Nurses, feel what? these kids' feet! But it was around 2012 and 2013 when people online finally started to question what was going on at Nickelodeon. I believe it was due to Amanda Bynes' very public downward spiral. It was around this time she made headlines for her first DUI, assaulting a member of the paparazzi, being seen in public looking disheveled and distraught. Then she was evicted from her New York City apartment, and she got some strange dimple piercings and even posted lewd photos that were not very flattering. In short, people were saying that she was going crazy, and naturally, they started to question the children's television industry that she grew up in. An infamous blind item appeared on the Crazy Days and Nights blog of someone trying to warn the public about Dan. He's a monster, the worst predator alive. And if you wonder why nobody will confront or charge him, he's in charge of multiple hit shows for Nick, which rakes in oceans of money. What about the parents? No tweener parent who shoved their kid into the limelight from birth is going to cross him either, and risk career and loss of revenue, no matter how bad it Fs up the kids. It was also around this time that a Redditor alleged that Dan offered them $100 to tickle their feet while on set of one of his shows. Now, none of these claims were backed by any real or substantial evidence, but it did get people talking. Media outlets finally began speaking out, questioning the intentions of children often have an adult sexiness that unsuccessfully straddles the line between tasteful and trampy. While guys are allowed to be quirky and weird looking, this says Disney TV is poisoning your daughters. Girls are uniformly cast from the same Bratz doll mold. Meanwhile, you had Dan posting things on his blog like, but what Kat does in this scene is a special variation of the spit take, where the liquid just falls out of her mouth. Yes, this is what I do for a living. I analyze the various kinds of spit takes. Not a bad job, smiley face. After this quote from Dan, we now know that this photo, which is on the official Zoe 101 IMD page, showing Victoria Justice with spit falling out of her mouth, is probably probably his creation. You also had people in the early 2010s analyzing his old tweets, ones where he was constantly talking about people's feet and toes. This toe belongs to one of the stars on one of my shows. Whose toe is this? To which he later tweeted, the toe belongs to the sweet and hilariously talented Miss Jeanette McCurdy. Sam and Cat tomorrow, right on the bottom of your foot, take a pic. Bro, this dude's mind is so warped, it's actually insane. Like the more he's like, getting spoken about and the more things I see that he tweets, Disgusting, bro. Use hashtag Sam and Cat Saturday. We will retweet and follow until our fingers get sore. I also found this extremely old Pepsi commercial Dan starred in in the late 80s, which potentially features an innuendo with the lotion shot splattering on the guy's chest. Then the focus of the entire commercial being on his feet not wanting to touch the sand because it's hot. And of course, there's females in the background in their bikinis. Dan was unaware of the digital renaissance aiming to take him down, and he was as reckless as ever. I my Carly was officially over and Victorious was scheduled to end a few months later. Schneider decided to hit two birds with one stone and make a dual spin-off for both shows. He took a fan favorite from My Carly in Sam Puckett and a fan favorite from Victorious in Cat Valentine and created a teen sitcom titled Sam and Cat. The premise of the show revolved around the unlikely friendship of Sam and Cat who meet and become roommates in Los Angeles while starting their own babysitting business to make ends meet, which is basically the same plot as his failed primetime sitcom from this the 90s. This is when I stopped watching the shows. Like, I, I didn't really watch Sam and Cat. The pilot debuted on Nickelodeon to 4.2 million viewers and was surprisingly popular despite being a spin-off that was clearly inferior to its original shows. However, Sam and Cat only lasted one season and was cancelled following controversy behind the scenes. Firstly, Jeanette McCurdy posted this strange vine. Hey Dan Schneider. I know you're watching my vine. Do you like my vine? Vine. 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 Look what you've done to me. Considering she would speak out against him 10 years later, we now know this was not our imagination. He was really making her crazy. In her 2022 memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, McCurdy detailed her childhood and how her mother, Deborah, forced her to become a child actor. Schneider was also mentioned in the memoir solely as the creator, whom McCurdy claimed created an unsafe work environment, frequently subjecting the cast and crew to emotional abuse. When Jeanette turned 18, 
and iCarly was coming to an end, the creator allegedly dangled the opportunity for Jeanette to have her own spinoff. She wrote that the creator took her out to dinner, where he encouraged her to try alcohol for the first time and gave her a shoulder massage. The creator is doing that thing that I've heard from my co-stars he does with every new star of a show that he's making. He takes you under his wing. You're his favorite. Additionally, there was a feud between Ariana and Jeanette brewing behind the scenes. On Jeanette's podcast, she discussed her time on Sam and Cat, revealing that she was jealous of Ariana Grande because executives allowed her the opportunity to pursue other business ventures while restricting McCurdy's career advancement. Every time something exciting happens to her, I feel like she robbed me of having that experience myself. And every time someone calls me a good sport, all I feel is how much I don't want to be one. Ariana misses work in pursuit of her music career while I act with a box. I'm pissed about it, and I'm pissed at her, jealous of her. In case you're wondering, one episode of Sam and Cat was based around Cat getting trapped in a box and Sam spent the whole episode trying to get her out. The writers had to come up with an episode without her because Ariana was busy with her music career and couldn't film. This show getting cancelled after one very successful season was likely due to this feud, but I'm sure Dan's behavior towards Jeanette and Ariana made it easy for them to sever ties with Nickelodeon. This basically marks the end of Dan's dominance at the network. He was recognized for his 20 years of work in Nickelodeon with their very first Lifetime Achievement Award in 2014. For the few online that were aware of the rumor surrounding Dan, this award rubbed them the wrong way. Slowly in 2014 and after, we saw more media coverage pointing out inappropriate moments in his shows. But again, the masses, the general public, had no idea what he was doing. And for a few years, people stopped talking about him online. Until 2017, when the Harvey Weinstein Me Too movement shook industry predators to their core, and Dan tried to make it out unscathed. In October of 2017, investigative reports by the New York Times conduct allegations against film producer Harvey Weinstein. This prompted bloggers who knew about Dan's history to discuss him once again. More blind items from the Crazy Days and Nights blog emerged, like this one that suggests Dan, the producer, was sleeping with cast members a producer who has been featured on this site from almost the very beginning. When she landed the part, the producer never mentioned anything about sleeping with her. All but one of them were underage. She suspected that because she was legal for almost the entire run of the show that he was just not that into her. At some point, he did try and sleep with her and she turned him down. That rejection cost her a bunch of scene reductions. Meanwhile, the producer found someone else to sleep with who was also legal but loved to roleplay super young. She was getting the good lines and scenes. She was being offered crossover opportunities and new shows were being developed for her. And again, this could just be people spreading lies, but now the pressure was on, and Nickelodeon, Dan Schneider, they could feel the heat. Websites like The Revenge of the Sis became fully dedicated to exposing the creepy nature of the Nickelodeon network. Coincidentally, as the pressure was at an all-time high, Nickelodeon cut ties with Dan Schneider in March of 2018 and paid him the $7 million still owed on his contract. They claim this separation was a natural next step and they are proud of the work he did for Nickelodeon. Deadline Hollywood reported that there had been complaints about Schneider's alleged behavior, including his well-documented temper issues for years. Years. Following reports that Nickelodeon and Schneider parted ways, Dan's Twitter account went quiet. He only rarely made public appearances. He also tried to erase everything on his blog, but we still got that. Nickelodeon Studios even released its reboot of iCarly for the Paramount Plus streaming platform without Schneider. From Dan's exit in 2018 until today, YouTubers, bloggers, previous cast members, and media outlets greatly contributed to informing the public about Dan's ways. Perhaps the most detailed and detrimental article was the 2022 Business Insider Deep Dive, which interviewed 15 of Dan's former co-workers, some of which spoke horrible things and others defended his character. Dan cared about the kids on his shows even when sometimes their own families unfortunately did not. Russell Hicks, Nickelodeon's former president of content and production wrote, he was the shoulder they It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. 
he 100% wholeheartedly admitted that he forced people to touch him, which is interesting because it becomes very difficult to believe that he would stop there. Perhaps the craziest part about this video is that there's still so much more that I could cover. Some people's entire YouTube channels are dedicated to bringing Dan's dark secrets to light. But I do want to leave off with this message. Just remember that it's easy to think that this is all just entertainment because, well, these allegations feature some of our favorite child stars. Remember that they were real victims that had to suffer. People have gotten so wrapped up and excited about this expose that they're now blaming innocent people for being complicit in these alleged crimes. For example, Zoe 101 star Matthew Underwood was getting death threats for not speaking out against Dan Schneider. So to prove to these people that he is innocent, he voiced two different times where he was sexually assaulted as a minor. So now after hearing many of the allegations, the rumors, the testimonies, the convictions, the confessions surrounding Dan Schneider's time on Nickelodeon, is it all just a coincidence, a conspiracy, or a calculated crime conglomerate? Bro, I don't really know how he's not, I don't really know how he's not in jail to be honest, because I didn't hear anything about Dan Schneider going to jail. And he has multiple different allegations against him. It's just unfortunate that the young the young stars of the show had to go through that, bro. And it wasn't only him. It was him and his little minions on the producer set that was doing all these crazy things, looking at these young people all weird and stuff. It's just it's a crazy, unfortunate situation, really. Comment down below any thoughts that came to your mind throughout this entire video right here because I do read the comments. Smash the like button, subscribe, and turn on post notifications. I'm going to catch you guys in the next one. Peace.